people kept telling me day in and day out when I was doing music, like your ethnicity is not necessarily an asset when we go out into the actual marketplace to the point where for my first album, the idea was to maybe do covers and promo imagery that didn't show my face, but maybe showed parts of my body or my hair or whatnot, just like anything that would kind of cover up the fact that I'm Asian. In a way, it was empowering because it was like, listen to my voice. Don't look at me. It was what got me in the door because I was so quote unquote unique, but it was also what never sealed the deal. My name is Sarah Porritt and I am a modern minority. Welcome to Modern Minorities. This is the show about work and life told through the lens of what makes each of us different. I'm Sharon Lee Tony, a Chinese American girl born and raised in New York City. And I'm Roman Segal, an Indian American boy who came from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. Through conversations with some really interesting people, we uncover the stories, perspectives, and often unspoken truths about how our guests uniquely experience the world. It doesn't matter where you're from, the color of your skin, or who you love. We're all minorities somehow, but we're no one's model minority. This is a show about all of you, for all of us. On today's show, we're talking to Sarah Porritt, who is the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Omnicom Media Group. And she's also the host and creator of the Hero Store podcast. And she's also a former pop star. But first, Remen, I'm almost afraid to ask, what's going on? <sighs> I'm really frustrated, dude. Oh, no. Why am I not surprised? What is it this time? Okay, maybe I should just stop reading the news. But last <laughs> yeah. week, I think I forwarded you this article. Uh, I read an article in The Guardian because I get all my best news from a foreign countries newspapers. And it's about Eric Clapton. And I'll read you the headline and a little bit of the article dated August 29th. Eric Clapton releases song seen as criticizing official response to COVID. This has got to stop, which is the name of the song. Line includes, I can't take this BS any longer and follows negative comments about restrictions. So to be clear, Eric Clapton, who growing up, I love former lead singer of Cream, yeah. Layla, Tears in Heaven. And there's totally. a story there, right? Like yep. Tears in Heaven is about his son crawling out the crib in the window and dying. That actually yeah. happened. But Eric Clapton, he's not saying, man, the response to COVID has been bad. We could be doing better. He's saying, how dare you make us take vaccines? How dare you make us wear masks? And to be clear, this is not my, this is why we can't have nice things argument, Sharon. Because the more I started thinking about it, and I'm pretty angry at Eric Clapton and Van Morrison and the other singer songwriters who are, I don't think, behaving responsibly with their platform, I kind of flipped it on its head. You know how I feel. I love Colin Kaepernick. I love that he decided to take a stand or took a kneel for something that's right. But people on the right highly criticized him for, you know, stay in your lane, just be an athlete, which I don't agree with. I'm like, use your power responsibly. Like people listen to you. You have this platform. So how is that any different from what Clapton's doing? I'm genuinely conflicted here because like, while I'm angry at Eric Clapton, it's like, how is that different? I I don't know, dude. Well, let's explore this a little bit, right? So Eric Clapton did get the vaccine. He reacted negatively to it, and that's part of what inspired this song. Yeah, but all most of us who did get the vaccine, I was knocked up for a few days. I was, yeah, it was terrible, but it was the responsible thing to do. I didn't go bitch about it on my podcast that nobody listens to. But you're also a big proponent of the vaccine. Like you believe that everybody should be getting it. You get upset when people don't get it. If he was on the fence about it and then he got it and he maybe he felt like he was going to die from it. I mean, I don't know the details of how bad his side effects were. Maybe that made him question the whole point of all of this and whether or not that was necessary. Well, I mean, again, a lot of us going in know that there's always side effects to these things and in clapton has referenced extensive scientific research which has found vaccines on offer in the uk to be safe he calls that propaganda and so this is kind of like that fine line because it's like i get it it's okay that you had a bad experience with it i might Mm -hmm. argue kind of keep that to yourself like i didn't talk on all my podcasts about how you know laid up i was because of my vaccine because that could scare people from getting it sure because the responsible thing to do for our kids, for our parents, for all of us is to collectively kind of do this. And again, it's not the question is like, why is it okay for me to be mad at Eric Clapton for using his platform to voice an opinion when I get mad at people for getting mad at Colin Kaepernick for using his platform to voice his opinion? Yeah. And I think that's human nature, right? So if we take a step back, vaccines or no vaccines, it's because you are on Colin Kaepernick's side. So whatever he says, 
you agree no, with? No, I disagree. I don't, no, 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 no. He could, he could like say that Warrior is not an amazing TV show, and I'd be like, Colin Kaepernick is an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, True. I, I'm on the side of the issue that he's on. I'm not blindly behind. Like, I love Eric Clapton's music, and I'm not a sports fan, to be clear. Right. Right. Like, if anyone, like, not knowing what their stances on issues were, if you were like, yo, Rumman, who would you rather have on your podcast, Colin Kaepernick? Again, not knowing their stance on issues. NFL athlete phenomenon Colin Kaepernick or former lead singer of Cream and rock legend Eric Clapton. I'd be like, Eric Clapton all day long. I want to know what comic books he reads. But it's not about the person. It's about the issue. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I mean, it's. I think it's a complicated thing. And, you know, my own personal experience has been I'm fully vaxxed now. Remen, by the way. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank And thank you for doing it for all of us. <laughs> and I actually had very little side effects, even with the second dose. But it was one of those decisions where it took me longer than I'm willing to admit to raise my hand and say, I'm, I'm willing to do this. And th- there's just a lot that goes into that. And I've been able to rationalize that with my children, like when it came to making decisions about their vaccination schedule and how we would approach that we actually decided to delay their vaccines quite a bit until they needed them for school. Oh, um, no, you're talking about not COVID, but the other ones. Yeah, just regular, okay. like, you know, regular pediatric vaccines. So anything that wasn't mandatory was pretty much just delayed or even f- completely like omitted from their, from their vaccine. Can I, can I ask you that? That's an interesting question. So, but if it was mandated, you would do it. That's right. Yeah. And I think that's where we get into the crux of the argument of should the COVID vaccine be mandated, right? Because I think if it was we'd have a, a lot of a lot a of lot the on the fence people, people. Yeah, right. on board. Yeah. I have a close friend in Cincinnati. We were having an argument about alcohol and marijuana and marijuana legalization. This is like a decade ago. And he was like, even though, you know, all the stats about uh, why marijuana is less bad than alcohol, drunk driving dress, you know, no one's getting stoned and having accidents in the car as many, right? And he's like, yeah, but one's illegal and one's not. And that mm. was his argument. So like, oh, wow. So it's not the science or the data. It's what's legal. And he's like, yeah, because I kind of trust the government. And, and this friend is kind of like a, a right-leaning friend, not super Trumpy, but just kind of like Mitt Romney, Republican. And I was like, wow, okay. So if the government says it, you trust in the government to have made the right decision. He's like, yeah. So it's kind of like, that's why I'm like, as much as people are going to bitch and moan about mask and vaccine mandates, it's like, yeah, but those people are going to bitch and moan no matter what. Right. But uh, there's a large group of people in the middle who are just kind of waiting for the law to be declared. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like your point of view on this, on vaccines with your kids. Yeah. Yeah. At least with their pediatric ones, because there were a couple of vaccines that they could have gotten when they were really, really little, like infants that mm-hmm. eventually they never needed again. And so that's what makes me question some of what's recommended. Um, but what if Eric Clapton made a song about which ones <laughs> were recommended? Or no, or what if Colin Kaepernick, like, let's uh, flip it. Like, what if in, uh, so, uh, so let's say the law, there's, there's no legal standing. What if a celebrity that you genuinely admire and respect came out for or against it? That's the part where I'm with you, where this is scary. Like, not I, I personally probably wouldn't be swayed either way by a celebrity, but when you have strong voices with big platforms that and, and people who you trust, when you have people who you trust, whether that is the government or celebrities or anybody telling you that this is how you should do something or telling you that this is good or bad, that's where it gets scary. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know if people trust us and I don't think we have a very big platform, (laughs) Sharon. (laughs) So why don't we get back to this week's episode where we're talking to Sarah Porritt, who's the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Omnicom Media Group. She's also the host and creator of the Hear Us Roar podcast, which features inspired conversations with fearless Asian women. And she's also a former pop star. (laughs) And she's also another woman in your life. You know, if, if I could talk to <laughs> Teen Roman and say how many amazing women I get to work with, uh, I then have to clarify that I just am inspired by the really rad women I get to work with on a day to day basis. You've told me so many amazing things about Sarah in the last two or three months since you've been working closely with her. I feel like I've gotten to know her very well and was even more impressed with her in our conversation. Yeah. And what I love is her story. There's so many things that are the same but so many things that are different. How and when she came to this country, the choices she chose to make pursuing her passions earlier and and how she ended up where she is today and how she has this common thread throughout all of it. Yeah. 
one thing that really struck me was the fact that professionally today, she's in a seat where she is overseeing diversity and inclusion and really making sure that all ad agencies and other media companies are abiding by that, right, in her role at Omnicom. And I think that really stems from so much of her own experience and her adventures. And I'm calling them adventures because I didn't know what to expect when I had heard about Sarah. I kind of put her in this box, right, of like who I thought she was or the types of experiences that she may have had. And this conversation took us all over to so many different places and in so many different realms. And I well, yeah. So guys- to my sister, this is not a conversation with a marketing person. <laughs> it might sound it like definitely. it, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely isn't. It definitely isn't. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy our friend Sarah Porritt. Sarah, welcome to the pod. It's so great to have you here. What's up? It's been much too long. (laughs) So Sharon, I don't want you to be jealous, but yeah, I've been talking to Sarah a lot. (laughs) I know. I'm actually very jealous, Sarah. I've heard so much about you and you're the other S woman in his life. (laughs) Don't be, don't be. As soon as you guys ramp this up again, you'll be right up there. (laughs) Well, you're always welcome at the table. Thank you. Well, so Sarah, I've become a big fan of yours, getting to know you, but even knowing about your day job and Mm -hmm. your secret past life. But before we get into that, I guess I got to ask, where are you from? I am actually from Xiamen, China, and it's a little island off the southeast coast of China. When you see pictures of it, you're going to be like, is that Hong Kong? Is that Hawaii? (laughs) It just doesn't. It's not what you would think of when you think of China. So I got really lucky in a way because growing up near the beach, it was just a different chill vibe. And even though we're really poor, I think I had some of the luxuries of nature. So I got to ask the ignorant American question that I'm sure is a follow up when you say that, but you don't sound like you're from there. Your name doesn't sound like it's Chinese. What What's up? Well, what's up is that I think that it isn't like the cutoff to, to learn a language and not have an accent, I think is around like 10 years old. You two probably know a bit more about childhood development than I do. So I came here when I was eight. So I thankfully didn't have an accent when I first learned English. And I I actually didn't know a lick of English before I came here and was born Chen Baiyu. Wait, what does that mean? Sorry. But Baiyu actually means white feather. And it comes from a poem about an arrow that shot through stone. Wow. So... (laughs) That is badass. My, par- my that parents is really were, badass. were very artistic about how they came about my name. <laughs> well, that so I don't talk about my kids that often and, and specifically their names, which I won't mention, but like I now have a second and we gave them Chinese middle names because they're half Chinese. And the literal translation of my elder daughter's middle name is uh, Jade Forest. And Ooh. so when we were coming up with my son's middle name, a good Chinese name that sounded right by Western ears, sounded kind of Chinese, but literally translates to Jade Wolf. So we have like Jade Forest and Jade Wolf. And I always thought that was cool. But Wait, I think White Feather is kind of... What's the story behind that? Now, you can't just leave us with this parrot. <laughs> <laughs> this is about you. I know it's just the root of the name is my wife's maiden name. So my middle name is actually my mom's maiden name. So we wanted to kind of carry that through. So Western first name, Chinese middle name, Indian last name. So the Jade is your wife's maiden name, right? Yes. Okay. See, now everyone can just like totally reverse engineer that. (laughs) (laughs) Google Translate. (laughs) So Sarah, I I guess, so you came over at eight and... uh, How did that happen? Did you come with your parents? Did you come to live with family? Can you tell us some stories from what that must have been like? Yeah. So my father actually came to the States and was a teacher's assistant for a couple years. So I was four. He came. My mom came when I was six years old. And when my mom came, I essentially lived with my grandparents for two years and I I missed them dearly. I thought about them every single day. And then two years later is when I came. And and honestly, that speaks to the immigrant struggle, right? Like they really wanted to make sure that they had their finances straight, that they had a nice apartment before I joined. And my mom, even though she was a police officer in China, she did a lot of odds and ends types of jobs here in the US, like bagging groceries and working at Chinese restaurants and absolutely nothing wrong with that, but definitely a departure from what she was doing in China. And even when I came here, it's the typical 
whole story. I lived in a little corner sectioned off in the apartment. I got my first Barbie doll dumpster diving in the trash with my grandparents. It was definitely a bit of a struggle, but I felt like I had so much love that surrounded me all the time. I never felt like I was deprived of anything. But the one memory I did have of coming to the States and flying over here with my mom's friend and her daughter was my grandparents told me that it's really, really cold in the US, that it snows. <laughs> and in Shaman, in tropical Shaman, there's just like not snow. And so yeah. they literally threw on four or five pairs of pants and like eight tops on me. <laughs> they pulled a jet wing. <laughs> I I like rolled out of the airport looking like a marshmallow. And I remember we had a pit stop in Japan. It was the first time I've ever seen a bath. And so I locked myself in the bathroom for literally half an hour. <laughs> threw some shampoo under the faucet and was like took my first ever bubble bath and my mom's wow. friend who was accompanying me freaked out <laughs> thought I had drowned or something I'm like no this is just my first experience of the non-Chinese life I guess I gotta ask so sorry how did you bathe in China like oh. no, not yeah, no, that's a really good question. So my grandparents had overhead showers with like okay, a water it, heater. But when I was living with my mom, so up until the age of six, we were in a shared space mm -hmm. where it was just like a, a pail of water yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the middle yeah. of the kitchen floor. And then we had a the makeshift bucket. sort of yeah. shower hanging from the ceiling. Uh, it's the bucket. Yeah, the bucket. The bucket was for peeing, pooping and showering. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I, I remember when I was six and I went to India for the first time, same thing. Like my dad mm -hmm. was like, yeah, dude, this is how, this is how we rolled hole in the ground and a bucket and a cup. <laughs> That's yep. it. And you got to do it in the morning because the water's only on for like a couple hours. Yeah, well, yeah. And we didn't even have running water. I like, literally it's like those Kung Fu movies where you have to go with the pail to the well and you get in <laughs> <Wow>. line <laughs> and, and then you can use a little bit of it for drinking a little bit of it for washing whatnot and so definitely very different than just turning on the faucet these days which sometimes I take for granted yeah you got to totally hold that over your kids one day <laughs> <laughs> I've seen actual washboards and not in the form of abs <laughs> <laughs> and so that was Japan then you eventually got to the US. What were some of your first impressions when you arrived? Well, my, my concept of the US involved a mix of James Bond, because that was who was on TV and like Disneyland. And yeah. so when I... <laughs> I can, honestly, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> honestly, when I came here, I didn't know what to expect. I mean, it wasn't like I was living the life of luxury in China. So it, mm -hmm. it was actually in some ways better in terms of just like having uh, like a, a stove that worked. <laughs> And, and running water. And I think probably the biggest transitional hurdle for me was the language and going to school and not feeling like I fit in because I just didn't speak English. I mean, Im mm -hmm. imagine feeling like an infant when you're supposed to be eight years old. And I knew some pretty advanced math for an, an eight year old at that point. But like, f just from a language standpoint, like nothing. I could point. <laughs> I could point. I could walk. Um but that was about it. And and honestly, the one person, I hate to say this, the one person that made me feel the most like an outsider, and I found this I found this out later on, was someone who was also Chinese American, who I thought was my friend. But I realized when I learned a little bit of English that she was actually making fun of me in front of the well, white kids. Using you to, uh, to elevate her status, right? What kids do, probably. What, I mean, whatever it was, I didn't like it. <laughs> but I, I would say that a, a lot of the kids around me, they did support me. Like they tried to teach me to read and they were just really, really sweet in helping me get acclimated to the atmosphere. And so were you in an ESL class or anything with other kids that were also learning English? I was. Those were the yeah. first words that I learned. I have to go to ESL. <laughs> <laughs> I think I use wow. that whenever I just wanted to leave the classroom. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then later on it was I have choir. <laughs> nice. So you're a, this little girl who comes over mm -hmm. and you clearly know more math than English. <laughs> and, uh, what what did you want to be? Like uh, did that change from what you wanted to be when you were growing up in China to once you got here and were surrounded by this difference and this kind of ocean of newness like what does little Sarah what did she want to be Raman what I want to be changes every year <laughs> 
Um, I, it's definitely been an evolution. I mean, I think in, when I was in China, I, I wanted to be a soldier in the communist army. <laughs> this was really? literally, the, I, they, I, no, I, I've never heard that before. They, from they, there's a lot wow. of propaganda yeah. in the early childhood literature. I mean, literally like learn your, learn your words. And this is a story about communism and how, how glorious it is to fight for your country. And so when I came here, we I totally don't do that here with G.I. Joe in Transformers <laughs> movies. And I the 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 world just kind of opened up. It was a completely different. I was I was being taught a completely different curriculum, completely different storyline. So I thought about a lot of other things that I could be other than a communist soldier. Like wow. I wanted to be a dentist at one point because my dentist would give me toys after he would clean my teeth. I was like, wow, he's like Santa Claus. Uh, <laughs> and then at one point, I got really obsessed with the Weather Channel because it felt like magic. Like you could predict the weather for the next day. I could be so prepared. I'm such a planner i could be prepared to, like to bring an umbrella and know what to wear i wanted to be a, like a weather woman on tv and i cycled through a lot of those different things until i realized okay i want to be a musician <laughs> i i love to sing i love american music there's just so much more soul in it than the music that i was accustomed to in china like that's what i was really drawn to much later and we hear you used to have a thing for mariah carey is that true I still have a thing for Mariah Carey. <laughs> <laughs> was, she, was she like the first one that like cracked open your brain and was like, oh my God, like that? Or wh who were who some of those early impressions, I guess? Mariah, TLC, Whitney Houston, Boys to Men, just like that really good 90s R&B. And then later on, when Neo Soul became a thing, it was like Jill Scott, Floetry, Music Soul Child. I don't know. There was just like, I, <laughs> I, I always felt this like, depth of love that I've had in my soul, and even as like a young child. <laughs> and I, I just never really quite knew how to express myself. And before I, I could really vocalize singing, even I just was so drawn to people that could showcase that depth of emotion within themselves and through their art. I remember being like four years old in the schoolyard thinking, I got to remember how deep I am and how smart I am as a four-year-old. So I never treat children that way so that I can imprint this memory in my mind, <laughs> which is such like a weird thought. I always remember that moment, but I always kind of go back to that. Like I've always felt this yearning for like a deeper connection to something. So how did the grandparents... Feel? How did your parents feel when you said, like, what did they want you to be? Like, because I don't think my parents were cool with some of my, I hate to say this, like the loftier things because of the immigrant story. Yeah, it's it's the same. But what I had going for me was that my parents were both musicians. They're still musicians in a way. My mom was an amazing singer. Wow. She She's much, much better than me. My dad plays the saxophone, the bamboo flute. He still has concerts. And he's wow. actually a music teacher now. They actually met in college because of music. And I found out later on that he got reprimanded for playing at a jazz club when he was teaching <laughs> at a university. And so I, I think that in a way, right, like they wanted me to follow the straight and narrow, the model minority dream. But in a way, too, I think in the back of their minds, they were living vicariously through my dreams. Now, the way I kind of justified it was I knew exactly what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to go to college. They wanted me to have a nine to five that was stable and well paid. They wanted me to get married. <laughs> so I did all those things. But in between, I lived my Sasha Fierce life where I quit high school twice took time off before going to college. Half the time I was in school, half the time I was in New York, DJing, doing music. And even throughout my media career, which is what I'm focused on right now from a diversity perspective, I very much was still an active musician doing gigs, marketing myself, doing PR, auditioning for shows. And so I think that was kind of like my personal justification. I just kind of did it. <laughs> Knowing that I was doing what it is that my parents wanted in a way, but also doing my own thing. So you're a rock star. That wasn't, I mean, that's kind of in your bio, but you were literally like <laughs> a music artist, like a I mean, pop, pop star, technically. Pop star, pop star. Pop star Hardly. Star. Aspiring <laughs> R&B artist. <laughs> and VJ, because awesome. I just like to talk. <laughs> 
And you were a VJ for MTV, right? MTV MTV U, U, which was MTV University. Yeah. So it was for their equivalent of like a TRL. Still very cool. Oh my gosh. And what what age does that start like for you? Like from the moment you're like, I like doing this. I'm going to do this on the side to, oh, this is the main thing that I'm doing. Like for some of us, whatever that thing is, Mm -hmm. either happens early or happens late, but you were threading that needle or you went full on into it. So how did that happen? When did that happen? Yeah, it was definitely a progression. And I think that I really started to get into it, believe it or not, and it's all tied together with my day job, when I realized the power of digital media, because I was in a girl group when I was just for like fun, like we got together for sleepovers during high school and a a bunch of Mm -hmm. my friends and I had started a little singing group and we recorded a, a rendition of Amazing Grace. And somehow it got picked up by the Washington Post online. I guess back in the day, they were just like, nothing online so they're like oh this is interesting a bunch of like asian (laughs) girls at a sleepover and this song came about and so i realized wow okay digital is really, really powerful. I wonder what I can do to self-promote. So I actually went on Craigslist and found an ad for one more or actually two more singers to complete an all Asian female R&B singing group in Brooklyn. I was like, this is a dream. I'm not 21, like what you're looking for, but I can sing and I'm Asian. And turns out it was legit. And that's why I had left for the first time, moved to Brooklyn, joined the singing group called NV or New Voices. And we just went on this whirlwind recording journey, transformation of like our physical appearance. I, at one point I had cornrows, like multicolor cornrows in a bandana, which is (laughs) so different. 180 from the nerd in high school. It was truly like making the band, but without the cameras, but also that, that the making the band concept comes with kind of like the mental and emotional abuse of like, you have to sit a certain way. These are things you can and can't eat which actually led to certain things like disordered eating later on in my life. Like you have to work out three hours a day. I better see it happening. I mean, it was very regimented and exactly what you would think of when you think of starting a girl group in the the late 90s, early 2000s. But that's what kind of kicked it off. That that opens my eyes to the possibilities. And Raman, I already think I know what you're thinking, which is like, how the heck did your parents allow you to do that? I just... I right. just did that it. That was my question. It's, yeah. mostly the, it's mostly just the cornrows. Just the cornrows alone. Well, <laughs> and I, the bandana. When I colored my hair. They were not happy at all when I did that. I was so shy. Like, I was the kid that hid under my mom's skirt. And so I think because it, they thought, okay, she's going to be with three other older Chinese young ladies who can help mentor her. <laughs> and <Influence> her. <laughs> this is something that she's never done before. She's always been a little chicken. So let's Let's just see what happens. <laughs> Maybe she'll learn some life skills w- without them knowing that this is just going to like snowball into so much more. Turns out at the very end, I was the only person left. I was the last woman standing and I ended up taking care of everybody else. But that really was kind of what kicked it off. And from there, I was hooked. I just had to keep going. And I just kept finding avenues online through friends, through my newfound friendships within music. Like, how do I keep it going? How do I innovate? And that's actually why I got into media and advertising. I wanted to figure out how to promote my myself for free the evil genius of it what yes so it sounds like in the music business you are on the road right what's the strangest thing that happened in that part of your career like the weirdest strangest most memorable thing from that time of your life there's a lot of strange moments when you are a young impressionable lady (laughs) who is going out there and doing her thing i would say the things that are probably a bit more expected are things like the fact that I got into the door of almost every single major record label, but faced a lot of discrimination. People saying there is no mm. marketing plan for you because no one else that looks like you exists. So I want you to do this and that. I want you to be completely not yourself. I will say there was a major record label that offered to give my girl group, the one I had in Brooklyn, a deal to Millie Vanilli. So basically do the singing for a black girl group. <laughs> And they were going to market it. Really, vanilla worked out, right? Yeah. Uh, So we would be the actual audio, and then the face would be a completely different group. That was pretty bizarre. But I would say, like, my most bizarre moment 
one of my most memorable and bizarre moments was being in a the, the equivalent of like a Motel 6 with KRS-One, the infamous rapper, <laughs> recording a song for him in the bathroom. And like uh, a lot of studios were kind of jerry-rigged back then. All you really need mm-hmm. was good sound equipment, a lot of sheets and blankets. So I remember there were like mm-hmm. blankets stapled onto the walls. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> to make like a makeshift sound studio. And that's where we recorded some music. It never, the song never came out. But I just remember that, like, even the big timers, if you go to the Motown Museum, um, the Motown sound is actually like if artists sang to, like, I think it used to be like a bathroom or something like that, but there was an echo chamber in the ceiling that you sang up to. And that's how you created the Motown sound. But a lot of these music, compositions and and recording spaces were very homemade back in the day. And I distinctly remember singing in a lot of bathrooms. (laughs) I feel like you need to write a book about this. There's definitely a book in there somewhere. At, at, at some point, and Sharon, our common friend Lucia, recently started saying that she's going to be the manager of my book tour or my publicist. <laughs> perfect, perfect. But we'll we'll see. We'll see. Ask Maybe her when if I she get knows older. how to braid cornrows. Yeah, she'll have to <laughs> fix your hair and stuff too. <laughs> I've steered what? clear of that. A lot of ha- hair fell out the last time I did that. So. <laughs> Well, so on this journey, like all of us have like these relationships with our cultural identity, so to speak, and Mm -hmm. yours is rooted in having been a kid and you kind of like just went full into American culture and this R&B lifestyle. How did you, did you weave in the Asian-ness? Did you maintain it or was it kind of like running away from it? Like Mm. how'd you thread that needle? I don't think I did. It's not that I ran away from it. I was just so immersed in hip hop in R&B culture for a good chunk of my life that I wasn't really surrounded very much by Asian people or Asian culture. I very much still identified as Chinese, Hmm. but it just was not a huge part of my day to day. And it wasn't that I was running away from it. It was definitely in my mind, something that gave me the energy that I needed to have this sort of like pioneering spirit. Like I want to be one of the first. And even if I'm not one of the first, I want to be building the foundation for the first Asian person to be doing music at this scale. So that was a motivating factor. But in terms of just the day to day, people kept telling me day in and day out when I was doing music, like your ethnicity is not necessarily an asset when we go out into the actual marketplace to the point where for my first album, supposed album back in those days, the idea was to maybe do covers and promo imagery that didn't show my face, but maybe showed parts of my body or like my hair or whatnot, just like anything that would kind of cover up the fact that I'm Asian. And I understood that from like a marketing standpoint, but I also, in a way it was empowering because it was like, listen to my voice. Don't look at me. Uh, I didn't learn this from anyone. I deliberately actually chose not to ever get voice lessons because I didn't want anybody to have the ability to say, oh, you learn how to sing like this. No, this is just how I sound. So in some ways, I mean, it was empowering, as you just said, but in some ways they were literally saying to you that being Asian might be a risk or a liability or something negative. Oh, absolutely. Yep. It was what got me in the door because I was so quote unquote unique, but it was also what never Mm -hmm. sealed the deal. (laughs) No no one inked anything. Because they didn't think anybody would ever. Yeah. And they didn't think anybody would ever um, want to buy it or that it would appeal to anyone. Right. And this was right around the time when record labels really started getting really rigid with their contracts with artists because people were making money from endorsements from movies. And so th- that's yeah. when the 360 deals got introduced. So it was no longer about, OK, we'll just take a risk on something that's unknown, put a bunch of money behind it because we can and we're a record label. Um Tower Records was starting to fold (laughs) later on in that conversation. So like digital was taking over. People had a lot more options. Artists were making money in different ways. So they were really scrambling at that point. The labels were were scrambling to figure out, okay, what is my business model? And is this a risk I'm willing to take? And in most instances, it was a hard no. In some instances where it was a maybe, I just wasn't willing to compromise. 
Yeah, I feel like back in that time, and we're still kind of living it, but the barriers Mm -hmm. to entry have fallen, but there's kind of like this first mover advantage. The whole world is changing. The sands are shifting beneath us. And the first artists, comedians, entrepreneurs who can jump in on the new tech, figure it out and get that first mover advantage. But everyone else is just like, you're getting left behind. And sometimes those are big companies. So, So your hack, your professional hack was okay, I got to get into this media industry. And you did that. And I guess that's interesting. But what's more interesting is the pivot or or kind of the evolution of your career once you got into the the media side of the game into DEI. Like you have a pretty big day job running like DEI for one of the world's largest advertising or media agencies. Like how did that happen? Like how did you not fall into the media agency world, but how did you like start evolving towards the DEI work? What? It's <laughs> it's the slashy in me. <laughs> I, I've Wait, always what does been... slashy mean? Slashy means we're a group of people that are one thing slash another thing uh, slash another thing. <laughs> and so I can I I just I always multi infinite now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I have I have the itch always. And the nine to five is fine and dandy. It was creative in some ways. It got me thinking about different things. I was still challenged, but in a lot of ways, I still itched for something more. And I think I realized later on in life that it wasn't just about my love of music. It was about the love of breaking barriers and shifting storylines. And that's really kind of what my podcast Hear Us Roar is about. It's really just to kind of introduce new potential (laughs) into people's mental storylines about what's possible for themselves. And so even though I was doing media strategy and investment for my nine to five, I think I I had always wanted to go above and beyond that. And, And outside of just doing my music thing outside of work, I brought purpose into my work in some ways as well. So really starting off with launching a a wellness program for my agency, launching some of their efforts from a nonprofit CSR standpoint, because I was really trying, and I always am just really trying to find purpose in everything that I do, even if I don't find purpose in the minutia of the day to day. And so I got very much ingrained and deeply involved in the culture of the, the various agencies where I worked. And then naturally, I think when DE&I became a necessity within large companies, the CEO said, Sarah's already doing this work. (laughs) She's already been doing it for us on top of her day job. So who better to take on this type of work? So when I was working at my previous agency, OMD, which is an agency underneath uh, Omnicom Media Group right now, which is where I do my DE&I work. I, I started leading up their diversity efforts. And obviously, I had to raise my hand for this job when it became available and open. And here I am as the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. And I think it just marries my two loves a lot more, the two passions, my day job, something that I've been really honing in on and cultivating, but also the fact that there is always this element of wanting to make others feel like they can accomplish whatever it is that they want to accomplish, empowerment in that diversity and inclusion. And that's what I do day in and day out. So what better than that? Because I've always lived separate lives and now it's much more conjoined. Well, so what I love about that, Sarah, is in your career in the nine to five, you felt maybe not empowered, but you were like, screw it. I want to make this change in the world. I'm going to try to go make the change on the inside for the things that I care about culturally. And I found like that's the best success. Then people are like, oh, well, you're already doing the work. Let's make this a thing. But The other thing I love, and I see a lot of myself in what you're doing, because while the podcast you have here is Roar, on the surface is very different. The motivation is the same. It's like, Mm -hmm, I see mm -hmm. this change that I need to see in the world. And sure, I can do it with my day job. But there's this other thing. Why can't I accomplish that? And that's what I've loved about the few episodes that I've gotten to listen to. So, But I guess in your own words, like, why did you get into podcasting? Like what gave you the itch or why do you get up every day to do your show? Because we all have too many other things to do, right? Yeah. The itch is because I'm always really itchy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just an itchy individual. And I hate to say it, but 
being a quote unquote pop star has an expiration date, just like modeling, right? Like I acknowledge the realities of that and I miss singing. I still do music here and there in pockets, but I think what I also missed about singing was this feeling of being able to empower others to dream bigger. And so podcasting just felt like the perfect form for longer form storytelling. And my podcast isn't about me. <laughs> it's about everybody else who is mm -hmm. breaking barriers. And I, I felt like it was just a way for me to continue doing some of the work that I had originally started because I mean, music's not easy. All all the no's, all the the closed doors, the money that I was spending, I didn't I didn't get to have nice things. And so I wanted to continue moving that mission forward and podcasting felt like a, a natural progression. And I had all the audio equipment already. <laughs> I, I know right. how to edit. <laughs> yeah. It's it's just right in front. There's literally nothing to fear when it came to actually doing the podcast themselves. That's when I really fell back in that recording groove and that storytelling group. It's funny. Sharon and I talk about this a lot because we're finally getting back in our groove after taking a few months off for my second kid. But we, we text and we talk and we're like, I miss doing this. It's like a thing that and motivations are similar, I think, for sure. But I get more out of this pod for me, even though it's for the audience. But when I don't have it, when I'm not hearing these stories about others, like I feel like I'm missing a part of myself. It's, it's like a weekly dose of inspiration. I mean, yeah, really, yeah. totally. And I'm sure you two get the same thing. But like once in a while, this happens with the pod and also with my music career. Once in a while, you get like an email from someone being like, oh, my gosh, you totally changed me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, I actually, we love those. We isn't love that those. Great? I, mm -hmm. I literally just got off the, the phone with someone who works with an Omnicom who said, my chief diversity officer shared your information with me. I literally in the last week and a half listened to every single episode. <laughs> And I know everything about you. I'm also from Shaman, China. <laughs> and I'm starting like a charity. I'm going into the media and advertising world. Can we have a conversation? Like you are totally helping me to, to rethink about my life and my career in a different way. And so it's like so empowering. Just like when I was doing music, I would get notes and emails here and there saying, I've never seen someone who looks like me on TV doing what I want to do with my life. You've given me the okay, the green light, the encouragement to pursue that. And so every little ounce of that is what keeps me going. And I'm sure you two are, are feeling a lot of that, that, that same motivation as well. You know, when I started my career in corporate America, the guy who recruited me and mentored me was like, take the time every morning to walk around the floor and talk to people and get to mm -hmm. know people. And that's probably some of the best advice I got in my career. Even once I left that big company, moving to New York City, working in a startup, uh, like meeting people when you would meet a vendor that was interesting beyond the vendor thing or the beyond the thing you're trying to sell them or pitch them. There's just fundamentally interesting people. And in every conversation, you can learn not just about them, but about yourself and reflect on things. And I think this show, I think all podcasting when done well is that it's, it's mm -hmm. almost like this re mm -hmm. reflection and full stop, like guilty admission. This show is such a great excuse to talk to people that I might not be able to talk to. Now. <laughs> like it's um, before, same. like an an author I admire, I can email <laughs> them as a fanboy and be like, "Hey, I really like your work. You want to get a coffee?" And they'd be like, "Uh, hell no." Versus, oh, "I have a podcast about race and gender and blah blah blah." <laughs> so. It's the exact same for me, Roman. <laughs> And, for that, and those and those episodes sure it's about the guests but it's like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a perk of it and it's right. not about it's as we've been thinking like i still want to talk to people that i never would have thought to talk to but right. at the same time like right 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 oh yeah there's people i want i'd love to why not i, I have this mm -hmm. like more cavalier attitude about the why can't i go have a conversation why can't we broach that topic and make sharon cringe in the middle of the conversation <laughs> <laughs> As Sharon cringes. <laughs> As I cringe. Kidding. Exactly. It's all about me cringing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> if Sharon's not cringing or crying, we're not doing our job. That's on this true. Show. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. <laughs> so let's pivot to personal matters. You've family life and, and other things. Like, How has that changed as you've morphed from being a pop star to now being a corporate guru, making big changes in the industry? What's your life like at, outside of the office? 
honestly, it's not that different. I'm still slashing away, <laughs> staying really itchy. It's not that different. I would say that my parents have probably a little bit more faith in my vision. Yeah. Because they were always like, what's media? Are you going to make money from that? <laughs> so yeah, do you we- make the commercials? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will even say that when I shifted over to my diversity career, my dad's like, what? Is your husband okay with this? I was like, dad, what what era are you from? Is this going to impact your career in an adverse fashion? So there's still a little bit of doubt, but I think that the fact that I, I do have a C-suite position, that I can pay my own bills, that I'm married, I did everything they wanted me to do other than play yeah. piano. <laughs> is definitely something that puts their minds a little bit more at ease. But all in all, I would say it's not all that different because I I still am am living that slashy life. And in terms of the husband, what was their... Is he a good Chinese boy? Right. Like what were their (laughs) expectations for the kind of man you'd marry? Yeah. He is a great Chinese boy. He's not Chinese. (laughs) (laughs) He takes his shoes off. (laughs) But he is a wonderful Chinese boy. He loves my mom's food. He actually learned how to make chow mi fin the other <laughs> the other wow. day. And he That's makes impressive. dumplings from scratch. <laughs> wow, that is like some pro move. That's some yeah, pro that move really game. is. Oh yeah. Does he, speak, I, does he speak Chinese at all? N- no. Although at one point he did download an app, but I made <laughs> such fun of the app because I was like, "Why is she speaking all funny?" The lady in the app, and so he was like, "Forget it." <laughs> But I think at some point, he'll probably pick that back up. But yes, I think because I've been so Americanized and because I think my husband, actually, he grew up around a lot of Indian people. (laughs) He, He has a lot of friends that are East Asian and South Asian. And so like our cultural worlds just kind of melted together really naturally. And so he's actually probably making me more Chinese than I was before in a weird way. So is your husband, is he also a media former recovering pop star? (laughs) <laughs> Not at all. He actually works in real estate. So very, very different. I think he respects what I do from a music standpoint. He's actually a huge music head. So one of the things that actually gelled us together in the beginning was just like going to cool concerts. But I, I think that definitely sort of like the music world was a little bit foreign to him, especially when we first started. But I mean, I think because I have been doing music much more behind the scenes these days, it feels less weird or odd. And from a media standpoint, that's a little bit more digestible than having cornrows and going out to album release parties at night. But but no, completely different worlds. I think his industry is a lot more old school, (laughs) which is another way in which we kind of balance each other out, which is nice. So if we were to go all the way back to maybe the moment that you, maybe the bathtub in Japan or maybe the cornrows, but if you were to have a conversation with your younger self, What is something you would tell her today? I would tell her to stop beating herself up. I think a lot of that sort of loneliness that I felt, I definitely went through bouts of depression in high school. I had, uh, my hair started going white and it actually came back to health. I like Benjamin buttoned a little bit from high school between some of the sort of like self-loathing with the way that I, I looked and felt about myself. I think a lot of that was just trying to fit in. So I would say stop giving a crap about what other people think. And and that's something that I certainly live by on a day to day today. Just do my best. <laughs> try, try to be a positive influence. Stop caring about what other people think. And that's when I think I feel so much more settled in my own skin. And I think it's mm-hmm. it's really hard to tell someone that until they've gone through the life experiences and you have realize to go through the who they are. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it would it would sound like bullshit to me. <laughs> <laughs> like lady, you don't get yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe what I would say then is, is one day this will all not matter at all. And you'll feel really good about who you are, <laughs> chip tooth and all, <laughs> and your hair will grow back to health. So it's just to care a little bit less wherever I was caring a little bit too much. That's all. Yeah, that is probably the best advice. Like once you can let go and mm-hmm. even it's something I carry so many of my anxieties from my youth and they pop back up. But the thing that gets me through them now is to think ahead 20 years from now. It's like, okay, is this meeting going to matter or is reading to my kid going to matter? Which of those two things is going to matter in 20 years? And then once I can zoom back out, I can like just come right back in and be like, 
oh, okay, I don't give a shit about this, but let's just get through it. So it's powerful, but I, I think you have to learn it by going through the ringer. You have to have those bad, sometimes terrible experiences. Yeah, I'm so grateful for them, honestly. I just, I mean, imagine what I'm going to be like when I'm 80 and I really don't give a crap. <laughs> <laughs> And if I don't give a crap now, <laughs> it'll such be such a fun. great way to look at it. <laughs> such a great way to look at it. You're so right. Like, I feel like now that we're in our, well, most of us are in our early forties, or at least I am, I feel like I've hit my stride and I'm mm-hmm. kind of like, okay, I'm, I know where I am. I'm confident with the decisions that I've made. I've learned a ton of lessons, but you're so right. In another 40 years, I'm totally not going to give a fuck. <laughs> we're going to be so fun. We should all hang out. I, I really like I have this other podcast where I do talk to older people like most because executives mostly and mm-hmm. they're like a different class of people mm-hmm. literally but there's a lot of more self-actualization and yes money does that but it's also age does that and yeah. I even like when I'm on like a backpacking trip and I find myself on like a ferry to Uruguay or something and I find myself sitting next to an old guy it's like I want to talk to the old guy yeah. <laughs> like they're they, mm-hmm. they probably have a much more interesting perspective or reason why they're on this ferry right now than me. So, yeah, absolutely. Sarah, we've covered pretty much everything <laughs> <laughs> and got in a lot of places. I, I didn't think we would. Yeah. But... I mean, we went from pooping to cornrows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what's, what's in between? <laughs> I don't know, Sharon. What do you think? Do you think she's ready for speed round? I think you're ready for oh, speed oh, round, Sarah. Okay. <laughs> hit, hit me. <laughs> what is something about you that no one expects? Oh, pretty much everything, right? But I I guess I am a chicken nugget eating champion. So I ate 37 (laughs) chicken nuggets in 10 minutes. This was for like a work event. My team threw me in knowing what a um, healthy eater I was after I already had a full lunch and two cookies. Whoa, 37 (laughs) nuggets in 10 minutes. That's impressive. Thanks. (laughs) What is a book, movie, or even a TV show that has characters that you relate to? Oh, book hmm i would probably say the alchemist because the story of that hero's journey is sort of going on an adventure and coming back home and realizing that the treasure has always been home and that i didn't need to look outside of myself to find that treasure yeah I think so, that book is like the most popular recommended book on this Yeah, podcast. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. I was going to say The Four Agreements, but there's no characters in there. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no, I feel like they, for a very sweet gift, Sharon sent me a copy of The Alchemist because I still oh. haven't read it. And I refuse to read it until Sharon watches the show Warrior. So just saying. <laughs> I was actually going to ask him if he's read it yet, Sarah, and I'm glad he just admitted himself that he hasn't. Okay. Did you accidentally (laughs) watch Warrior in the meantime? I didn't. (laughs) No. (laughs) That's like the one. We're just going to hold out on each other forever. Forever. It's like the stalemate until we're old, 80 year old. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. What is your favorite mom dish? Mom dish. Oh my gosh. I mean, I I don't know if I have a favorite. It's a rotation of favorites. Literally, I got to spend a week with my mom about three weeks ago. I made a list. (laughs) I didn't tell her what was on my list, but I made like a wish list. I would say Chalmi Finn is still like on the top of that list. Although now that I, my husband and I both know how to make it, it's following behind other things like like steamed sea bass. She makes an amazing steamed sea bass, but there's just so much. I can't even name them all. She uses like garlic, ginger and scallions and soy sauce and all of that in her sea oh, bass. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I tried to make it the other day, not the same. <laughs> That's one it's thing I haven't quite same. perfected. No. Yeah. It's, it seems like it's simple because it's like four ingredients probably, but I can never make it the way that like my grandmother used to make it. It just yeah. never tastes the same. Mm-hmm. We got to figure it out. We will eventually. <laughs> <laughs> what is your least favorite food? Oh my gosh. Probably carrots. <laughs> what? Explain. <laughs> carrots. Uh, oh, I don't, I just, I don't like carrots. I don't like bell peppers. I also don't like butterflies scare me. There's a lot of weird things that I have. <laughs> People who are late, I'm allergic to. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I don't like the taste. I'll eat thousand year, you know, egg (laughs) and, and all kinds of weird stuff, but carrots, not a fan. I don't know. Yeah. Something happened to you, man. I think the only thing that might have happened to me that scarred me was my mom was really into carrot juice for a while. So she was juicing carrots every day (laughs) and she literally turned orange. 
Oh my. This is a thing. I looked it up. This is, it, it actually can it can do that to you. So yeah, my, the, my mom the was beta a carotene. carotene. The beta yes. carotene I think makes your skin orange if you have too much. So she was <laughs> drinking a lot of carrot juice. Yes. I think we'll accept that answer. It's a, it's Thank an interesting you. one. We've Thank heard you. celery, which okay. I understand celery a little more than carrots, but I get it. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> this is the question where I learned to hate our guests. Like seriously. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like if someone says pizza, Remen just writes them off. It's like, oh, no, uh-uh. can't be friends Episode anymore. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. Bye. <laughs> Who's someone out there that you would want on a podcast? Oh, well, if I didn't have Hear Us Roar and if, if I can interview anyone dead or alive, probably Anthony Bourdain. Oh, my God. He's yeah. just so fascinating. I mean, between the adventure and the food, and you just can't get better than that. And I think there's something intriguing about him because he you can tell he's like a troubled soul. The writing in the darkness, exactly. And so I just feel like that would be such a fascinating individual to talk to and to dig into if he ever allowed someone in. I mean, back in the day. It's so interesting because we're getting older and the people that we came up with are passing away. And Mm -hmm. musicians are the ones that Mm -hmm. impacted me the most over the years. Elliot Smith, Kurt Cobain, Mm -hmm. Tom Petty. But Bourdain was one of the few non-musicians that Mm. with news of his passing, because of like, he spoke to us during kind of like this formative moment when we were exploring and he was a little further down the road than us. And it just like hit me in the gut so hard. Wow. Yeah, I I mean, I don't know if it was like hormones or PMS. I cried. Yeah. <laughs> I really like and I don't really do that. Weirdly, I, I cried uh, when I heard about Bourdain's death and also Alex Trebek, because I just mm. that was like a staple in my day. Yeah. And he was so strong all the way up until the end. There's just something about those two. So, Sarah, what does being a modern minority mean? mean to you? I mean, I'm going to give you the DE&I answer because (laughs) (laughs) the minority is quickly becoming the majority. So I think being a modern minority is someone who's curing the the culture of tomorrow. Um, We are creating that culture and we're co-creating it together with everybody else around us. So I think there's something really empowering about that. That's so good. That is a good answer. (laughs) That is a great answer. (laughs) Well, well, Sarah, it's been really fun just going deep. I am so glad that you just were able to open up and kind of share more about who you are and where you've been. And I I can't wait to see what's next. Yeah, we need to all hang out at some point. Definitely 40 years down the road, but definitely (laughs) just crotchety old people. That's right. That's right. Give a shit. <laughs> Sarah, thank you for spending time with us and for sharing all of your amazing of stories. Of course. It's You're such doing a pleasure. great things in the world. And I'm super excited to now officially know you, but also to keep following your journey. <laughs> well, thank you both. This is so fun. I really appreciate it. And that's our show. Like what you heard? Please subscribe, leave a review, and a five star rating on your favorite podcasting platform. Now more than ever, people need to be hearing these stories. Please share our show with a friend or three. Want to learn more or got something to share? Visit modmypod.com or email us, hi mom, at modmypod.com. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at modminpod. We'd love to hear from you. Now here's a preview of our next episode. Complex problems can be broken down into small steps. And so you actually don't need to figure out the whole thing at the beginning. I'm increasingly comfortable with the notion that I don't know it all, but I can figure it out. The toughest part for most people is to take the first step. And so I take the first step and I will continue to make forward progress until I hit something where I say this doesn't make sense. So I'm okay putting it aside or I'll continue going until it actually becomes something. I find that oftentimes when we talk about entrepreneurship, we see where the arrow landed and then draw a bullseye around it and say, this was my intent the whole time. Aren't I a genius? And that's very rarely true. It would enable a lot of people to realize that it's messier than they believe. That's it for now. I've been Raman Segel. And I'm still Sharon Lee Tony. Remember, we're all modern minorities out there. We'll talk to you soon.